Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar series. Uh, this is an online series which we've started uh, just to get uh, more uh, people engaged into the neurosurgery and the advancements in neurosurgery. Uh, just a brief uh, about my institution. I will, uh, this is a, we work at Shifa International. Okay, this is one of the leading hospitals in the country. Uh, and is at the cutting edge of the technology that we are providing to uh, patients in Pakistan uh, and probably around UAE and some other countries as well. Uh, we've taken this initiative to invite uh, uh, world leaders uh, in their uh, specialties uh, to talk about and uh, share their experiences uh, in the field of uh, neurosurgery. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk less about uh, Professor Tipu Aziz, who's currently online. He's actually well known around the world uh, in the field of functional neurosurgery. But I'll give a brief uh, account of uh, my uh, introduction to neurosurgery. And Professor Tipu Aziz was like uh, close to two decades ago. Uh, the first ever case that I encountered uh, was Professor Tipu Aziz doing a, a case of Parkinson. He was putting a deep brain stimulation. And I think at that time he was doing a wake. Uh, he, he used to do them awake, which he's going to go through in detail. And that was at the Radcliffe Infirmary. And the moment the stimulator went in, the tremors of that patient stopped. And I think that was a feeling I could not, I still can't forget to this day, uh, even though it's been uh, almost 20 years. Uh, I'm going to cut the story short. We've got Professor Tipu Aziz online. Uh, and he's going to give us uh, a historical perspective and his thoughts about functional neurosurgery and uh, take us through it. Uh, to you, uh, Professor Aziz. Uh, thank you very much. I'll um, basically talk about the history of functional neurosurgery in the UK and largely based in uh, on the background of Oxford because prior to... Um, Oxford starting functional neurosurgery, the specialty as it exists now was dead in the UK. And I thought talking about Oxford has uh, more interest because Akbar was trained with us for about four years in Oxford. And it made sense to talk about the role of Oxford in functional neurosurgery. So if you don't mind, I'll start my talk now if you, you're, you're happy. Yes, please go ahead. So basically, I'll talk about Oxford and the rebirth of British functional neurosurgery. And what I would like to say also is that it was not just British functional neurosurgery, because parallel to this, uh, functional neurosurgery around the world uh, had a rebirth. Now, the history, uh, let's see. Let me just, ah, yeah. So functional neurosurgery, how do we define it? It's defined as destruction or chronic excitation or brain stimulation of part of the central nervous system to treat a disorder of function or even behavior. I went to university, first of all, in the UK in the early 70s to study the uh, uh, neuromuscular junction of this uh, type of worm called the nematode, because it was of very uh, great interest to me. But when I was at university and studying uh, the, the physiology of the nematode, I came across, we were shown this uh, uh, movie. Now, this is an illustration of a gentleman, pre levodopa who had intractable tremor. And it's a video of a surgeon called Irving Cooper, who was a pioneer of this sort of surgery. And here he is passing a cryoprobe, a freezing probe into the motor thalamus. And you can see the patient has terrible tremor. And what they did in those days was measure the freezing at the tip of the probe. And as the motor thalamus was frozen in the right target, you'll see that the tremor disappears. And to me, as a physiologist in those days, it seemed very interesting that you could actually take a person with a neurological disorder and destroy tissue and restore normality. 
And because of that, I was very interested in functional neurosurgery and went into medicine to study that. Now, the a principle of a lesional surgery, as you can see here, is that if you pass a current through an electrode, as you can see here, you can see that the tissue coagulates, become destroyed. And by destruction of that pathway, you can alleviate movement disorders or pain or even psychiatric disorders. Now, what is Parkinson's disease for those who don't really see it much? You can see the patients have severe tremor. They're unable to move and their limbs are very rigid. And in those days, there wasn't deep brain stimulation. So what we did in those days was treat these patients with what we called a pallidotomy. And um, that would cause a quite dramatic reversal of the condition. But then surgery disappeared because with the introduction of levodopa, you can see this is a patient with severe Parkinson's disease, unable to move, you see? And then you give him levodopa. And you can see a dramatic improvement in these patients. So as a result of the dramatic effect of levodopa, functional surgery died, you see, in the 70s and 80s. It disappeared because neurologists believed that if levodopa was so effective in Parkinson's disease, then certain drugs would be found to treat all other movement disorder conditions and therefore functional surgery died. But however, what remains true is that tremor in Parkinson's disease is often resistant to drug therapy. And one had to find a way to restore function to these people. And this illustrates some work I did in the um, uh, 80s with my uh, uh, boss at the time, Mike Torrens in Bristol. In those days, there was no MRI scan. And so we looked at ways of targeting the brain using CT scan. And we looked at CT guided thalamotomy in the treatment of movement disorders. And that was my introduction to functional neurosurgery. But the problem is, if you see, best medical management in the late 80s, early 90s, led to this sort of situation. Patients would either be tremulous, rigid, unable to move, or you give them drugs, and this is the situation they end up in. And that was Parkinson's disease management in the late 80s, early 90s. However, one needed to understand the neural mechanisms that underlay Parkinson's disease. And because of this finding, this is an illustration of what happened when some drug addicts in California presented with Parkinson's. And the, uh, it became apparent that they were using a derivative of pethidine called MPTP. And when they took this drug, you can see they became rigid, unable to move, and some of them developed tremor. And so for the first time, people were able to induce Parkinson's disease using a single drug in the human condition. And if you gave it to monkeys, monkeys also developed it. And that led to this International Congress in Manchester, which was very important in 1988 where we presented a thalamotomy, but also in uh, Manchester, they provided evidence in monkeys to show using, in those days, there's no functional imaging as such, but you would give them tritiated radioactive 2-deoxyglucose to a monkey. 
and the 2-deoxyglucose would be taken up in areas which were receiving more active synaptic inputs. And what you can see here is that if you give a monkey MPTP on one side of the brain and compared to the other side, which is normal, you can see that the subthalamic nucleus receives less input using 2-deoxyglucose than on the normal side. The implication is the subthalamic nucleus receives a lot of inhibitory input from the external pallidum and uh, normally should be uh, uh, controlled. But in this monkey, it becomes overactive, you see. And deeper in the brain, there's an area called a PPN, which we'll come to later. That shows that it has an increased input, which is largely inhibitory. So the theory uh, that came out in those times that the subthalamic nucleus is overactive in Parkinson's disease. So the question was, what happens if you actually try to lesion the subthalamic nucleus? And so what we did was I joined a Professor Crossman in Manchester in the late 80s. And we did, this is what uh, two deoxyglucose films look like. And what we were able to show that after two deoxyglucose autoradiography, making a lesion in the right subthalamic nucleus, there's also a decreased uptake in the PPN. And the question uh, uh, raised in those days was the role of PPN in Parkinson's disease. But before that, this is a monkey after MPTP. And you can see it's flexed, it's immobile, it's unable to move. And so we made lesions in the subthalamic nucleus and the monkeys were immediately reversed from Parkinson's disease. But the problem is with neurologists is that they were very frightened of lesioning the subthalamic nucleus because those of you who treat post-stroke patients, you'll see some patients who've got terrible hemibalism while thrashing of the arms and legs as a result of strokes in the subthalamic nucleus. And therefore people were frightened of offering this as a therapy. So we published this showing the effects of lesioning the subthalamic nucleus and showing that we could reverse Parkinson's disease in the monkey. And you can see here that after MPTP, monkey's activity count is very low. They can hardly move. You lesion one side of the subthalamic nucleus and immediately you see the activity count increases. And if you do the other side, there's also some added benefit. And if you look at the clinical rating scale for a monkey, after MPTP, it's very, very high. They're severely Parkinsonian. And look at the degree of reversal once you make a lesion in the subthalamic nucleus and the added benefit to a degree of doing the other side. And this is the second monkey we did, which illustrated the same. Now, because of the fear of lesioning the subthalamic nucleus, in France around the same time, they were able to show that if you put electrodes in the subthalamic nucleus and stimulate at high frequency so that you can block the output of the subthalamic nucleus, you could get the same effects. And therefore, this uh, observation was rapidly transferred to the clinical situation. But the problem was, you see, by that time, functional neurosurgery ceased to exist, as I showed in the earlier slides. And I was looking for a job as a senior registrar in the UK. And despite visiting and interviewing at 15 centers, no one believed that functional surgery had a future until I came to Oxford in 92 
And my boss at the time, Chris Adams, suggested that if no one was doing it in the UK or even globally, I might as well start there. And that was where we started. And in Oxford, UK at the time, there was no functional neurosurgery. Our initial experiences were rapidly um, uh, passed on globally. And here you can see that myself and Peter Silben, a neurology colleague at the time, we started a center in Brisbane. And since 1996, when we started Brisbane, Brisbane has become one of the world's busiest centers academically and clinically. And this is Peter Silburn and myself in Oxford in a very favored place of ours. But to do functional surgery, you need the tools and you needed a very accurate frame. You need the imaging to get the electrodes in the right place. And this is Eric Cosman, who passed away two years ago, who owned a company called Radionics. And they were involved in the first flush of functional neuro neurosurgery, when people use stereotactic frames and ventriculography, in injecting contrast into the brain to target uh, deep structures. But Eric Cosman was very interested in radio surgery and developed the tools of merging MRI scans, which were just coming out at the time, with CT scan. Because MRI scans, although they give you very beautiful pictures, they're not accurate in three-dimensional space. But Eric's uh, company was able to show that if you took an MRI scan, you can merge it on computers with a stereotactic CT scan a technique called now image fusion. And you could eliminate the inaccuracies of the MRI scan, and you could target uh, deep structures in the brain like here in the paladin. And so he agreed with me to develop the tools in combination with lesioning, because in those days there weren't deep brain stimulation, to start introducing functional neurosurgery. However, deep brain stimulation had a future because this is Delgado who worked in Spain and in uh, the US in California in the 1950s. And he was able to show that you could implant stimulators. This is what he called a stimulator because it could stimulate and receive uh, impulses from outside. And you could control the stimulator. And he was able to show, this is from the 50s, this is a bull with a stimulator implanted. And you can see that when you turn the stimulator on, he could stop the bull from um, uh, aggressively pursuing this gentleman. So the tools were there in the 50s. But the problem was, in those days, there wasn't a reliable, fully implantable device. So deep brain stimulation, although it was there, didn't really become popular. And the, so what's the concept of deep brain stimulation today? As you DBS can see- DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker. You can see that you can put electrodes- flexible wires called leads completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin in the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. So you can see, since the mid, since the late 80s, really, an implantable uh, form of uh, deep brain stimulation was uh, created by the company called Medtronic, which everybody probably knows now globally. And with that, it became possible to treat both sides of the brain effectively with deep brain stimulation. So what can you see with deep brain stimulation now? Carrying on from the monkey studies, this is a patient with Parkinson's disease. She was young. We treated her soon after we did all the monkey experiments. And you can see that the Parkinson's disease is very severe. She can hardly move. And 
And then after you've implanted, this is a year after surgery, you can see that she is virtually normal off medication. So as a result of this, the possibility of reversing Parkinson's disease exploded. And to date, about 200,000 people around the world have had deep brain stimulation implanted for Parkinson's disease. Now, what do we see today? In 1992, Oxford was the only center in the UK offering functional neurosurgery. Today, across the UK, there are 16 centers. And what I would say is that probably half of the surgeons across the UK have been trained in Oxford to take their skills elsewhere. Australia, we started Australian centers. In 1995, I came to the Aga Khan University in Karachi to start functional neurosurgery there. I don't know what the situation is now. Um, Akbar can probably tell you more. Uh, India has become a widely uh, adopting uh, deep brain stimulation. What you will also hear is that uh, across the world, people use microelectrode recording, uh, a recording from single neurons to target. But in Oxford, we developed a technique of just using image guided non microelectrode recording. We're incorporating new uh, imaging techniques, one of them called diffusion tensor imaging, where you can map the fibers in the brain uh, uh, to put um, your electrodes in. Because the targeting is so much better, we don't need to do patients awake anymore. We use leads that can offer directional uh, current delivery. We can guide the electrodes current um, to where we want to. There are new programming platforms. Other companies have come out with uh, deep brain stimulation, such as Boston or Abbott or PINs in China, in addition to Medtronic. In Oxford also, we've worked on using the deep brain signals to drive deep brain stimulation, what we call closed loop stimulation. And certainly what is becoming popular across the world where you can afford it is using a robotic uh, techniques of guiding electrodes into the right place. So in Oxford, how do we do it? First of all, well before surgery, patients have an MRI scan. And using the computer, we can plan before surgery where to put the electrodes. Then the patient has a frame fixed to his skull. And when we scan the patient and merge the CT with the MRI scan, we can calculate onto the frame the coordinates we measured on the computer. And we can match the frame accuracy by putting it on this, what we call a phantom with the same measurements. But we have to make sure that the electrode in the frame meets the same point in the phantom. And then we put the patient's head in the frame. We drill a hole in the skull because we're so, we can plan so accurately, the hole is only about two and a half millimeters across. We get the effect that we want, and then we implant the electrode and connect it to a pacemaker. This illustrates the technique that we use in Oxford. The patient's awake, this is a patient with tremor. The electrode is passed to target. And you can see that when you stimulate, you make sure that the tremor is stopped. So you see on table, as Agbar says, you can get the effect immediately. But then again in Oxford, we went on to do other things. Image guided surgery didn't exist in those days. And so working with radionics, what we developed 
was this technique of using these mechanical arms to guide based on CT scans uh, where to make holes in the skull and to take the tumor out. These days, of course, all of you have seen um, uh, uh, non-mechanical operating systems uh, with laser guidance and everything to take brain tumors out. And then again, we carried on with uh, our monkey studies with Professor John Stein in Oxford. And we were looking at the target, the pedunculopontine nucleus, which lies at the level of the inferior colliculus in the brainstem. And we were able to show that it was relevant to Parkinson's disease in that it degenerates into the Parkinsonian brain. In akinetic disorders, it also degenerates and degenerates also in some forms of dystonia. And we were able to show that radio frequency and uh, neurotoxic lesions induced akinesia. And if we stimulate at low frequency, we could induce tremor and turning away from the um, electrode. And high frequency stimulation induced in akinesia. And this is a Parkinsonian monkey, you see, with MPTP. And when we injected bicuculin, which is a GABA inhibitor, which blocks inhibition, we could reverse uh, the uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so we were able to show that we could reverse akinesia in the Parkinsonian monkey. What would it do in the human? So this is uh, the effect of PPN stimulation. You can see how deep the electrodes are in the brain. And this is a gentleman in his 50s with a good response above his waist to levodopa. But you can see when he tries to walk, initiation is very difficult. So we implanted pedunculopontine nucleus electrode. And this is him. Nine years after implantation, and he remains well. But PPN stimulation still hasn't caught on globally because of uh, people aren't really clear on what sort of patients to implant. But we still do it, and it's still effective. So in Oxford today, what sort of conditions do we treat? This is a patient with dystonia before, after implant. This is a young girl. This is 74 years old. When and this she is came to us, she was dying. Seven and a half years old. And, <laughs> and then pain, intractable pain. This is a patient with terrible phantom leg pain, if you just touch it, it's painful. And after stimulation, you can see the pain has disappeared. So Oxford became one of the big centers of uh, deep brain stimulation for pain. The other thing we do, uh, I'll talk very briefly, is putting spinal cord stimulators in for intractable pain, largely uh, failed back surgery. And also, these days, you can be even more focused. You can pass electrodes percutaneously into the dorsal root ganglion to really focus um, a pain relief. The other thing that Oxford has been involved in the past has been fighting for the research uh, using monkeys for Parkinson's disease. And we led one of the first scientific marches in support of animal research. And today, as you can see, Oxford for neuromodulation is the busiest center in the UK or has been until COVID hit us and we've stopped completely. So what I would like to finish on is just to say that our experience in Oxford has led to a revival of British stereotactic neurosurgery and possibly globally too. And I'd, on that uh, final thought, Thank you for listening to me.
Many thanks, Prof. That was very uh, interesting, and uh, I think uh, all the audiences would appreciate uh, all the videos and the work that you put in uh, into looking after the patients over the uh, quite a few decades, actually three, four decades almost. Uh, I had a few questions. Uh, uh, one of them was like, um, uh, what do you think the future of uh, deep brain stimulation goes from here onwards? You mentioned about movement disorders, you mentioned about pain. Uh, where do you think the future from here goes? Uh, and the second limb to that same question is there have been like instances uh, uh, while I was working in Oxford with you around that time that the research uh, into functional neurosurgery was kind of uh, halted or slowed down. Do you think that has uh, limited the expansion of functional neurosurgery to a certain extent or do you think there's still more to it? Well, so several things. On a global uh, framework, deep brain stimulation is extremely expensive for those of us in the third world trying to look for treatment. And therefore, uh, I would think that in addition to deep brain stimulation, a service that is treating movement disorders should also look at the effects of lesioning, you see, so that you can offer both and tailor an economic solution to each patient. So. Deep brain stimulation is very effective for movement disorders. <coughs> it has a role in pain, certainly. It is possible that it has some psychiatric indications. So if you have a good team, deep brain stimulation can treat a multitude of diseases. But the trade-off is that it's very expensive, you see. And as for research, Globally, it's become very difficult to do animal research. And therefore, uh, there are limitations to that. There are limitations in funding also. So yes, you're right. Uh, a lot of research has slowed down. I mean, our monkey lab in Oxford has closed down in 2008, and we've not been able to open it again. Uh, yet we were able to show that the subthalamic nucleus and the pedunculopontine nucleus were um, very effective targets. Uh, I don't see a way forward on that in the West. But if you look at China, if you look at India, uh, animal research is still going on. And a lot of the progress will come from your end, you see. One more question, Prof, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was related to, I mean, uh, you've got the experience of, uh, I mean, you've been around the world uh, helping out people and setting up uh, functional neurosurgery. Uh, yeah, and you had, a, I think, uh, in Al Khan with Rashid Juma as well, you had a bit of a stint. I think it was in uh, mid-90s around that time. Yeah. Uh, things have moved on from there onwards. We are sitting in 2021 20, uh, now. And uh, I think, uh, uh, what are your thoughts about developing countries, uh, comparing India, about uh, setting up functional neurosurgery in this day and age in a developing country, uh, which has significantly developed from third world to a developing country? First of all, you need um, people like yourselves. Critical is a very good neurologist, is I think more important than uh, the surgery can be done safely. But to deliver that service, you need a really good neurologist. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, evolving. Uh, like, Javid has been to the Cleveland Clinic and is bringing his experience to your hospital. Um, uh, that's the main thing. I think the weakness of functional surgery in the developing world has been the lack of experience of neurologists. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nabil, do you want to ask anything? Uh, no, thank you so much. That was a very wonderful talk. It was very enlightening. I am sure that our audience must have appreciated uh, your uh, excellent uh, thoughts and uh, wisdom. So uh, do you want to take a break or should I just go ahead and... So, so, so Akbar, um, I will have to do an outpatient clinic now. So I'll have to leave you here at this moment.
Is a question has come from an anonymous uh, person, he, uh, and it's the same question they're asking, Prof, is for you. Uh, what mm -hmm. kind of treatment or technology in Pakistan is effective for a middle-class Parkinson patient? It depends on the symptoms. Like, if it's tremor, one can easily do a thalamotomy to restore uh, function in one side. Bilateral thalamotomy is less easy to do so. And if they're dyskinetic, is the main problem. One can also offer a pallidotomy. Um, uh, those are the most economic um, uh, solutions. But if one had the money, one could go for deep brain stimulation. But that is, I don't know what the cost is in Pakistan, but it is, it's a huge amount of money. In Bangladesh, it's not an option.